Welcome. This is the first lesson in discrete mathematics. We begin at the beginning, chapter one, and when we look at section 1.1, that kind of gives us an overview of some of the mathematics that we're going to experience during this course. Today we'll look at three big examples, the Josephus problem, playing games, and logical organization. Let's take a look. So the Josephus problem. This is actually uh, based on a real life event that happened during the first century. In the first century Jewish revolt against Rome, Josephus and 39 of his comrades were holed out against the Romans in a cave. With defeat imminent, they resolved that they would rather die than be slaves to the Romans. They decided to arrange themselves in a circle. One man was designated as number one, and they proceeded clockwise, killing every seventh man. Josephus, according to the story that he wrote, was, among other things, a mathematician. So he instantly figured out where he ought to sit in order to be the last to go. But when the time came, and only he remained, instead of killing himself, he surrendered to the Romans. All right, so let's play this game a little bit. And what we really want to do is figure out, <laughs> like Josephus, where do you want to sit should you find yourself in a similar situation? If there are 10 people numbered 1 to 10 in a circle, and every other person is killed starting with number 2, which person is left? Where do you want to sit should you find yourself in this situation with 9 of your friends? All right, so we'll demonstrate the picture here to the right. So person number 1 is listed, and then 2, and 3, and so on. And person number 2 is the first to go. And then after that, we skip 3, and 4 is next. And then from four, we skip five, and six is killed. Six, and then eight, and then from eight, and then 10 goes. But now here's where it gets interesting. Person 10 was the most recent person killed. At this point, we skip one, and person three is the next to go. So three is out of there. From three, we skip five, and seven is killed. From seven, we skip 9, and then 1 goes, 1, skip 5, and then number 9 is killed. And so 5 is very fortunate. 5 is the last person remaining uh, in this situation. So 5. Which person is left? In this, quote, game, in this, in this game of Josephus, when there are 10 people, Person number five is the last to remain. We might give this a mathematical notation, say j of 10 equals five. When there are 10 people, position five is the last one that remains. We might ask ourselves, what if there had been 11 people to begin with? In that situation, who would be the last to go? Or 12 people or 70 people? So we can have a chart here. And on the top row is the number of people that are in a circle initially. And in the second row, we have the position of the person who remains. So we see uh, the five is here because we just figured out when there are 10 people, position number five is the last that remains. Do this for me. Uh, figure out a few of these on your own, maybe say eight, nine, 11, and 12. Uh, pause the video, work those out, and then when you're ready to see the solution, start the video up again. Okay, give it a try. All right, I'm assuming that you have given it an earnest try. Here are the results. So there are some interesting patterns. Hopefully uh, your numbers match what I have here on the screen. Um, but what do you see? So it starts with 1 and then goes up by 2s up through 15. But then at 16, it starts over at 1. And then 3, 5, 7, again, up all these odd numbers up to 31. Now, look at this funny hiccup that occurs after 15 when it goes back to 1. It, notice that the pattern can't continue, right? If I went 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, I can't really have 17 when there's only 16 people. In a way, well, in a way, person number 17, when there are 16 people, is kind of like a person number one. So in, 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 a, in a weird little sense, it's almost like the pattern really does continue, but I need to recount. 
So what do you think is going to happen at the end of this process if I wanted to add 32? Well, 25, 27, 29, 31, it looks like it ought to be 33, the person in position 33, but if there are 32 people, then the person in position 33 is really in position 1. So maybe there's a pattern that uh, looks good here. So here are a few questions we might ask regarding these results. Number one, what do you predict j of 32 will be? And we said 1. Once again, pause the video, give problems 2 through 4 a try, and when you're ready, start it up again. All right, so how about problem number 2? Describe the values of n for which uh, j of n equals 1. Well, we saw when n is 8, it has a value of 1. When n is 16, it has a value of 1. When n is 32, the uh, ending position is 1. These look like powers of 2. So how do I express powers of 2? I might say uh, n equals 2 to the k for k equals 1, 2, 3, and so on. And we might actually just do a little experiment. What if k is 1? There's, there's only two people in my circle. And if there's only two people in my circle, the game starts by killing person number 2. One remains and one wins. Okay, that, that's good. What if there are four people? 1, 2, 3, 4. Person number 2 is killed. Then number 4 is killed. We pass 1. We go to 3. 3 is killed and one remains. So it looks like that works. If there are two people in my group, then person number one is the last. If there are four people in my group, then person number one is the last also. Alright, question number three. How is each value of j n related to the previous value of j n minus one? So we might actually make a little um, function here, and I guess maybe a piecewise function is the best way to describe this. Uh, from the previous work, we said j of n equals 1 if uh, n equals 2 to the k, uh, where k is some natural number, 1, 2, 3, and so on. But if it's not 1, if, if, if the function value is not 1, I can figure out the function value by looking at the previous one and just adding 2, like 9 is 2 more than 7, 15 is 2 more than 13. So I can take my previous value, j of n minus 1, and add 2 to that. And I'll just say the word otherwise here in my piecewise function. All right, so that brings us to j70, and I think the answer is 13. So I'll let you do the work for that and see if you can figure that out. Remember, I think, I think uh, j of 64 is going to be 1. So work it out from there. All right, moving on. Uh, example number two, it's just a game. Here are some examples of games that we will see uh, in this course. Imagine players A and B are competing in a best of three series. The first person to win two games wins the series. So there are a series of games that are being played. And maybe A wins the first game and then B wins the second game, so they're all tied up. And then if A wins the third game, a wins the series because A had uh, two games. It could have gone that A wins the first and B wins the second and then B wins the third game, in which case B wins the series. Now this series doesn't always have to go all three games. It could be that A wins twice in a row right, right away, in which case A wins the series and the series is over. So here's the question. Let's say that A will win a game with a probability of point six, so a little bit better than half. A is, a is a little bit of a better player than B. What is the probability that A is going to win the whole series? Pause the video, think about this for a couple minutes, and then start up again when you're ready. All right, I think a good way to start is by listing out all the possible series where A actually wins the series. So it could be that uh, A wins just right away. A wins the first game, A wins the second game, and done. Now if A doesn't win immediately, maybe A wins the first game and then B wins, but A still has to win the series, so I need an A after that. And there is only one other possibility, maybe B wins the first game, and then A wins the second, 
and A wins the third. So those are the only three series where A wins the series. Now let's figure out the probability that A wins both of the first games. Uh, A wins both of the games right away. Uh, that's going to be 0 0.6 times 0 0.6. A wins the first and A wins the second. How about this second series? 0 0.6 times 0.4 times 0.6. A and then B and then A. And this third series, 0 0.4 and then 0 0.6 and then 0 0.6. So this first probability, A wins both games right away, that probability is 0.36. Now these other guys, those are probabilities, if you do the multiplication, 0.144. And so either this first case occurs or the second case or the third case. And so we add those probabilities together. And when we add them, the sum of those probabilities is 0.64. Eight. So A has a little bit better than a 0.6 chance of winning the whole series. And that's comforting because if A wins any little game, any individual game with probability 0.6, it seems like it ought to win the series with maybe even a slightly higher probability. Now if you didn't follow all of the details in this example, don't worry about it too much. We will revisit this kind of uh, calculation later on and we will justify why exactly these calculations are the correct one in order to give us our solution. Here's Before we leave point number two, here's another similar example. Suppose that A and B are now playing table tennis and they are currently tied 10 to 10. In table tennis, the first player to 11 wins, but you must win by two. And once again, we'll suppose that A is a little bit of a better player than, than B, and A has a probability of 0.6 of winning any point. So what is the probability that A wins the table tennis game? This situation has a little bit of a different character to it than the previous one. So if they're currently tied, A wins a point and B wins a point, then we're back to the start again. It could be that A wins a point and B wins a point and now they're tied 12 to 12 and then maybe B wins a point and A wins a point and they're tied 13 13 until finally A wins a point, A wins another point and A wins by two. But we had a lot of previous points before the end game and this going back and forth and tying things up, that could last a long, long time. In fact, it can last an arbitrarily long time. We don't know how long it will end. So we, we can't write out all the possibilities for endgame situations like we could in the previous problem. So how do we solve this? And I will not tell you the solution right now, but ask that you think about it. And uh, later on in the course, we will solve this problem. All right. Our third item, logical organization, and this isn't a puzzle so much as it is just an idea that will be present throughout the rest of the course. Let's say that you flip three coins, say a quarter, a dime, and a nickel. How many results are possible? So results, I mean like heads and tail combination. Find an orderly way to list them all. So let's see, we have a quarter, dime and nickel and so one result might be tail tail head another result might be head tail tail another result might be all heads but these are kind of randomly ordered here how would you make a list an orderly list that includes all the possible results for the three coins pause the video for a second give it a try and then start up again when you're ready all right, here's how I might do this. Let's see, quarter, dime, nickel. I'll start with all tails, tail, tail, tail. And I want to, re want to introduce as few heads as possible, but starting from the right. So maybe tail, tail, head. And then tail, head, tail. And tail, head, head. All right, and then head, tail, tail head, tail, head, 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 tail, head, head, head. So this organization, you might look a little familiar if you are familiar with uh, binary arithmetic. It's a little bit like the 
counting in binary. So there is that correspondence if you're, if you're familiar with that. We'll talk more about that later in the semester. And there are uh, eight possible ways altogether to uh, list the results. Here's the second question. If you flip a coin, if you flip a single coin five times, how many ways can the result contain exactly two heads? Find an orderly way to list them all. And I might start off by saying, let's just imagine that the two heads are the first, and then I'll just use blanks to represent the tails to make it a little bit easier. What In, in what other ways can those two heads appear among the five positions? So maybe it's head, tail, head, and the remaining two are tails. Head, tail, tail, head, tail, head, tail, 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 head. Do you see how I'm organizing this list? Maybe now is a good time to pause it and see if you can finish out the list on your own. Start up again when you're ready. All right, so at this point, the rightmost head has moved all the way to the right. So I'll take the left head and move it in a little bit. Head, head, tail, tail. And then tail, head, tail, head, tail. Tail, tail, head. Move that guy in, start over, and then we end up with the two heads on the far right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There are ten possibilities. This is called a choosing problem. In fact, the way we might say this problem is this is five choose two. And we might notate this as a capital C and then with a 5 in there, 5 comma 2, and the answer equals 10. So 5 choose 2 equals 10. Another way you see this, actually a very common way that you see this written, is in parentheses as a vertical stack. So there's no fraction bar, just 5 over 2. And we read this 5 choose 2 equals 10. But here's a question, I mean, what is the actual calculation? What am I, how am I combining the 5 and the 2 to make 10? Here's a question at the very end. If you flip a coin 40 times, how many ways can the result have exactly 17 heads? We're asking for 40, choose 17. How in the world do you calculate that? So I won't tell you that answer. We will address that later. But this is a good to think about. How, uh, how could you calculate this kind of, uh, this kind of a number? All right, so I will leave it at that point. We have seen an introduction to discrete mathematics. We've seen some puzzles and games, some uh, logical organization. These are the big ideas, and I hope you enjoy them. I, I certainly enjoy this course, and I like thinking about these things. So I will stop there. Thank you.